Good morning, and welcome to Lafayette Presbyterian Church on this, the Lord's Day, even if it is a little bit of a rainy Lord's Day, we are glad that you are here. Several announcements to share among God's people this day. First, a huge thank you to everyone who was involved in big and small ways helping to prepare this place meal and everything that went into the service for Harold Wilson yesterday. Last Sunday when I left uh, church from downstairs, I left my robe downstairs because I thought we're going to be back down there next week. I have no reason to take it upstairs. And then uh, with the passing of Harold and the family's desire and prayer to be in this sanctuary for his service, Lots of people put in lots of hours uh, to make that happen, and I am grateful. The luncheon yesterday that the congregation provided was well appreciated, um, and again, just a thank you to everyone on behalf of myself and the family wanted me to share that as well. A couple of other announcements this evening during our fellowship time, Beverly Foster will hopefully be joining us to talk about the African American History Museum that's open and other things going along with that work, which this church has helped support in the past. So I invite you, if you are able, to join us for that time. Also, we had a very quick and abbreviated session meeting right before church with one item on the agenda, and that was to uh, declare that next Sunday after church, we will have a congregational meeting. It should be rather short uh, with one action item and one report. The report is the budget for the upcoming year. Oh, two action items within that. The budget for the upcoming year, and then the um, report from the nominating committee for an elder to be elected for the class of 2026. I had to do the math in my head, and unfortunately it was three years. I didn't have to take off my, my shoes. Uh, so the class of 2026. And a trustee as well. So those are the items that will come from the nominating committee um, on next Sunday. I'll announce it again next Sunday, which means I will have announced it two Sundays, which means I will fulfill the book of order requirements. But we have to be sure to do that, and then we will have a brief meeting after church. Um, and we hope you will be in attendance if possible. Um, are there other prayer concerns or announcements from God's people this day? Prayers for continued healing. Thank you, David. Yes, Jim. Prayer for her as well. Finally, prayers uh, I, I would covet for my uh, mom and dad and our entire family. Um, my dad's best friend since first grade, who had been living with them since they moved into their new house a little over four years ago now, um, in their upstairs area. Uh, suddenly passed away this week. They found him. And he had had a, a massive heart attack, the coroner believes, um, and 
died instantly. Uh, so that has been a difficult time uh, for them. Um, and Mark uh, was a very, very good friend of our, our families. He vacationed with us. He, he was, he was a, a family, I guess it is, um, as they say. And so uh, it's a little quieter in their house. Uh, a, a sad thing, um, but at the same time, we rejoice that there was no suffering according to the coroner as quickly and peacefully, and uh, so we would just covet prayers for them. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God together in spirit. You would please join me in our call to worship taken from Psalms 27. Your heart beckons you to come to seek God's face. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We gather in the presence of God. Let us open our hearts and minds in worship. Please stand as you are able and join in hymn number 411, Arise, Your Light is Come. to confession. We pause here to focus our minds and our hearts on you, God, in this prayer. The psalmist, ages ago, lifted their prayers to you in faithful confidence that you would hear and receive their petitions. Following their lead, we lift our petitions for the world, our communities, and our loved ones. Let us pause here to confess the sins that have been kept that have kept us from recognizing and enjoying God's presence. Participate in the prayer of confession, please. Gracious God, when despair and suffering overwhelm us, we cry out for you and feel abandoned. We doubt your presence and your promises. We believe you have turned away from us in anger. We ask why you have forsaken us. In these moments, strengthen us in faith and fill our hearts with courage. We believe, God. Help our unbelief.
Amen. Please join in our assurance of pardon taken from Psalms 103. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting and everlasting. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace to one another. Let us pray. God of Epiphanies, Reveal yourself to us in diverse and numerous ways. Free us from the distractions that turn our focus away from you and your word. Open us to the truth you reveal to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 27. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The evildoers assail me to devour my flesh. My adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he shall hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait the Lord. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, wait, chapter 4, that's wrong, my bad. Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee. Now when Jesus' heart heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulon, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. 
And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. For that time Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in a boat with their father Zebedee. Mending their nets, he called them. Immediately they followed, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our redeemer. Christ. Amen. Before I begin, I want to reread one little piece of the scripture that Sydney read, because sometimes we skip over it. We get to the calling of those first disciples. So, so here again, verses 12 and 13 and following. It says, now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake in the territory of Zebulun and Nataphli, so that it had been spoken through the prophets Isaiah would be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across Jordan, Galilee of Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Now, the liturgical calendar, you, 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 you see it up there under the date in the bulletin. It says that it is the third Sunday after Epiphany. But those of us in the state of Georgia know that two other very important seasons are occurring. One, one, the state of Georgia's legislative body is back in session. It's always a time for those of us who work in the public sector to tremble in fear as to what they might do next. Secondly, secondly, it is NFL football playoff time, which means I best get you out of here before kickoff. And I hear a couple of amens out there quietly. Not till, oh, I got plenty of time then. I keep up with both. And sometimes, though rarely, sometimes the the sport of football and the Georgia legislative branch, they, they cross over and, 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 and join together for something. Now, now, usually it happens when they recognize a, a longtime high school coach who's retiring or, or some state championships or, or there may have been a national championship from Georgia. I, I don't know anything about that. But, but they bring those folks in and they cheer and clap and then they get to work. Every two or three decades under the gold dome, there, there's a big movement to, to go ahead and, 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 and get some public tax relief so that some billion quadrillionaires can build a new stadium. They, they need that kind of help, you know, for things. And, 
And, and this current one we've got, it, it's not too old now. It, it has a roof that opens and closes. And it doesn't just go open and close like this. It spins around, looks like a bird. Oh, it's impressive. I figure in the next one, we're probably going to have it float up during the game. I mean, who knows what, what's the next one. Every once in a while, some serious legislation involving both our elected football officials, football, and education comes on the docket. And friends, I did not want you to miss it. At the State House, a bipartisan, well, don't you love bipartisanship? A bipartisan group, three Republicans and three Democrats have come together that is going to adopt some legislation. It's, it's a game changer. It truly is. You see, what caused this legislation was that, that at the last state championship football games, at one of the games, the referee botched a call. It cost one team the game. So a bipartisan group proposed an extreme remedy House Bill 32, sponsored by these folks, says that no high school which receives funding shall participate in sports events that does not utilize instant replay in its championship games. The bill specifies that it is for football only. An AJC writer noted that the measure appears unnecessary because Georgia High School was, was looking to bring in instant replay to championship games, but it is a reminder. It is a reminder that in Georgia, football just means more. Of course, there's some other bills, bills that have been proposed forever. Some things like asking athletes when they get their first physical to play high school sports, that they receive an echocardiogram. You know, it's a non-invasive procedure. It's sort of like a sonogram for the heart. You know, you, you put the stuff on, make sure that the, the heart's beating. It, it can be used to detect underlying cardiac conditions. That there's also a bill for MRIs for a kid who might get a concussion an MRI before they could return, you know, part of health and safety protocols. Those bills are unlikely to even get out of committee because they cost too much. We got money to pay for replays, don't we? Of course, such of a, a lack of concern for health and safety in the game of football is not true. And, and in truth, Current safety protocols are much better than night and day when my dad played football at Georgia Tech. At Tech, his position coach at the time was a much younger Jerry Glanville. You might remember Jerry Glanville. He ended up coaching a head coach for the Houston Oilers and the Atlanta Falcons. He always wore black on the sidelines and left tickets for Elvis at the will call gate. Old Jerry Glanville was quite a character. Regarding injuries back in my days, he would tell a player who came off the field complaining about being hurt, he said, I have a solution for you, son. Spit on it. It'll get better. Go back into the game. I think he actually also coined the term for what the NFL, the N, the F, and the L letters actually stood for when asked his opinion about how long players' careers would last and why he didn't like athletes leaving school early and said they should stay in school to get their degrees. He said to the press one time, the NFL really stands for not for long which is how long most of these players' careers will be in the NFL. He noted players are quickly replaced after they get injured, even when they return, because often they're a step slower. The realities of injuries and replacements has led another term to be used by all NFL teams. It's trickled over into all sports, in fact. I'm not sure who first started using the term, 
but most teams all around the country now have the philosophy of next man up. The NFL season is brutal, and at any time, any player may go down with injury. It might be a star, it might be an obscure but vital lineman, it doesn't matter. When a player is injured, it's the next man up. Maybe you're really the right tackle, but the starting left guard is injured. No matter, you better be ready to take his place. A linebacker might find himself playing on the defensive line. A receiver might end up being in the defensive backfield. It means you're not only willing to jump in at the fray at any moment's notice, but also willing to do so without making an excuse about how you've never practiced playing that position. I mean, you might not know. A lineman might end up having to kick extra points. The Dallas Cowboys might should have tried that on Friday when when the, the pro kicker missed four extra points in one game. Talk about having a bad night on national TV. The idea, of course, is you have to be ready. No excuses. And this is important. You you ought to know what everybody does for each play and, and not just what you do. You might be wondering what all this has to do with the Gospel of Matthew. Well, the text from the story in the Gospel of Matthew comes with the arrest of John the Baptist. Quickly, quickly it becomes a case of next man up. Later in his Gospel, Matthew will tell us both why John was arrested and what happened to him. Neither story is pleasant, but but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, the most important thing to know about John's arrest was that he had been fearlessly speaking truth to power. He had been calling out. That's the modern term we use. He'd been calling out Herod Antipas. Now, if you study Middle Eastern history, H.A., as I will call him, only ruled a portion of what his daddy, Herod the Great, had reigned. And because of his diminished power, this Herod was even more paranoid than his dad. And most historians claim he was even more brutal than his dad. Think about that. More brutal than his dad who had infants and toddlers murdered. Now the other thing to know about old H.A., I say it politely in church. He had sort of a Peyton Place thing going, if you remember the old book. Uh, uh, He would have been a good guest on Dr. Phil. Well, no, no, Jerry Springer. Springer would probably be where he belongs. You see, see, this Herod had married, well, he hadn't married. He he had an ongoing affair, or, or in the South, we would say he was shacking up with his brother's wife. Herodias. Additionally, Herodias' first husband, Herod's brother, and H.A., they were also her uncle. See what I mean about Jerry Springer? Now, obviously, this was against the law of Moses, and this was a person overseeing the Jewish community. Religious leaders, however, They weren't going to speak out, not when the consequences of criticizing Herod could be both professional and and physical suicide. John the Baptist, however, John the Baptist wasn't afraid to speak the truth to power, and eventually, at his sort of wife's urging, he had him arrested because of that. There's a lesson there. Friends, any time we speak for justice in the face of injustice, there's a possibility of ostracism, criticism, or sometimes worse. However, with John the Baptist, Herod did not execute him initially 
because John was popular. He thought maybe he could keep things quiet. You know, let him sit for a while and rot. Executing John didn't happen until old H.A. made a promise. He, he was a little bit, how do we say this politely in church, intoxicated. He was intoxicated at a party. And he made a promise to his wife's daughter that she could have anything up to half of his kingdom. And so she went to her mother for advice. And her mother said, go ask him to send you John the Baptist's head on a platter. As I said, this is not a happy story. Don't forget that earlier in the gospel, in fact, Sidney wanted to read it too, Matthew told the story of Herod, the great bloodthirsty king in response to the news from the Magi about the birth of Jesus, the slaughter of innocents. Shortly after that story, Matthew showed us the ministry of John, the baptism of Jesus by John, and, and the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And if I understand the text, part of what Matthew is doing is setting up his gospel in this way. With everything he shares, including the arrest of John, there is a clear warning to the people who are reading his gospel, a warning that things that are unpleasant might happen to those who fearlessly do God's work. It's a warning at the start that reading this and following Jesus may not always be easy. In fact, it's serious business. Now, it would seem to me that, that anybody with any sense, John or Jesus, would, would push the limits a little bit. You know, you know push it a little bit, and, and then when Herod got all upset, made some press release, yet you back off for a while. That's time for a good vacation, let things calm down, and, 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 and then come back again. But, but that's not how John and Jesus went about it. They didn't wait for public opinion to sway their direction. Instead, instead, John continues to poke the bear, as they say. And because of that, because of that, he is put to death, his head on a platter. And in that moment, Jesus, Jesus, out and begins his ministry. He becomes the next one up. He understands the arrest of John is not a signal to hide out, but a signal to begin. Jesus models for his disciples and you and I what we are to do when we are the next one up. Additionally, by Jesus' actions, we discover the Lord does not ask us to do anything he was not willing to do himself. Thus, Jesus not only spoke to power, he shouted to power. He found ways to, to poke the bear. I mean, he healed on the Sabbath. He looked for ways to get underneath the powerful skin. And Jesus delivers the same message as John the Baptist. Repent. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. As the next one up, Jesus doesn't back down. The scripture Matthew quoted in our reading is a paraphrase of the verses from Isaiah 9. And it was a definite challenge to the worldly rulers of that day and all days forward. It says, land of Zebulon, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. What was Isaiah referring to when he spoke about people walking in a great darkness? Well, precisely, he was talking about King Ahaz of Judah. King Ahaz had rejected the guidance of God and instead chosen to ally himself 
with the king of Assyria. The king's got a long, complicated name. You can look it up and try to pronounce it later. Just trust me. He was the king of Assyria. King Ahaz showed worldly powers over trusting the power of God. He put his trust in this Assyrian king because he, he was fearful of the kings of Israel and Syria. Isaiah told him that those kings were powerless to hurt him, that God would protect him, but Ahaz paid no attention to Isaiah. So Isaiah looked to the future, to the next one up, to the birth of a new king who would enlighten all who walked in darkness. Matthew, knowing this scripture, told his readers that the next one up, the one that the Jews were anticipating to be the Messiah, that that one that Isaiah had discussed was Jesus. He was there in flesh. You, you have to remember, Matthew is, is writing his gospel to the Jewish people to show that Jesus is the Messiah. And as a way of proving his point, he points some of the things out that Jesus did to show that this was who Isaiah referred to. And one of the first things Jesus did after stepping up and following John's arrest was to arrange for some folk to follow him, calling disciples who would work their way up into the role to be the next ones up. The words translated in our text says, make, as in follow me and I will make you fish for people. It is a terrible translation. There really isn't a good translation of the word make, to be honest with you. The, the, the Greek word is, is theo, and, and it's a verb that's much more active than simply make. The, the best that, that most scholars can agree on for an English translation is equip. Follow me, and I will equip. the difference. Follow me and I will equip you to fish for people. Note that Jesus is creating disciples, not just converts. Unfortunately, we in America, we American Christians are sometimes caught up with numbers, aren't we? We, we want bigger and more numbers. We look at how many instead of how deep. I know a guy in college, Laura will know who I'm talking about. He had a notebook that he kept with him most of the time. In that notebook, he listed all of the people he had evangelized to and saved. It was a running list, page after page after page. Back, back, back in college, I, I wasn't quite as a, a laid back as I am now. I always looked for, for a good ecumenical conversation. That's a, that's a fight is what it is. And, and he and I were, were discussing it one day, and, and, and I asked him, I asked him, how many of those people in that book do you still know? Well, I still know some of them. I said, how many of those people do you know where they go to church now and if they're involved, you know, after you save them? He said, well, I don't know. That's not my worry. I would argue it is absolutely our worry. I know a lots of churches that grow fast, touting new members coming in the front door while almost an equal number head is quickly out the back. Following and discipleship are not short-term things. Discipleships are called to follow for the long haul. Jesus says, follow, suggesting by his word that we are to do as he does and these disciples do. Now, at that point, I know they certainly don't appreciate what that means. They're just asked to follow and something leads them to this man and they do so. It's only much later when Jesus gives them the pop test about the crucial question. He, he says, who, who do people say that I am? Now the disciples, and to Peter's credit, they somehow get the answer right. 
when he declares Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Of course, even the right answer given verbally or, or on paper doesn't mean they're going to act that way. You, you remember Peter, right? His first big question, he doesn't know who Jesus is, says it three different times after our Lord is arrested. It means that sometimes even us Christians fail. Jesus didn't give up on them. Jesus, by word and deed, even in the face of darkness and John's death and other worldly troubles, calls and equips the first disciples and is patient with them. And later they would become the early apostles of the church. They are part of the great light, great light that shines in the darkness even today. They are the first of that great cloud of witnesses. Cloud of witnesses that now includes many friends, including the beloved Harold Wilson, we remembered in this sanctuary yesterday, and who by the power of the resurrection, along with so many others, watch over us, I'd like to say the story gets better, but the truth is it it doesn't necessarily get any better. There are good moments, moments of joy for, for Jesus and those first disciples. There are also some really hard times if you read the gospel. I mean, even after his resurrection, when Jesus met the 11 remaining disciples, Matthew notes in his scripture some doubt. Yet Jesus didn't divide his followers into believers and doubters. He gave them all, whether they had doubts or not, the work of ministry and mission to do. He says, go therefore and make disciples, not converts, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Friends, they were the next one up. And before they were arrested and in some case martyred or or, or died like everyone else, they had called other disciples to be the next ones up. Since those early days, generations and generations have been called, have been asked to stand up and be the next one up when it was their time. Oh, 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 some have been martyrs. Some have given their lives as missionaries or or chaplains or in the military or or as trailblazers for justice. Some of those names we remember when we think about the mission of Jesus. But most, most ordinary folk like you and me, they were small business owners or, or farmers, electricians or or CEOs, quilters, homemakers, businessmen and women. Some were sweepers and mopper-uppers. Whatever ministry God called them to, they were the next one up. And they were called whether they felt qualified or not. They just said yes when asked. Oh, some have names we remember, but most were ordinary folks who simply went about doing the good God placed in front of them to do, and in so doing, quietly changed the lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. Harold Wilson was one of those. His name won't go in any history book. Important enough that his name is written on. So now, now the next one up is us. Even now, God calls us. It may be to continue doing something we've always done that we're good at for the sake of Jesus Christ and the ministry of the church. Maybe, maybe sometimes we're called to do something new, something different from the ministry we're used to. 
calling us to be the next one up by redirecting us to a task for which we feel unprepared, unaccustomed, and ill-equipped, yet God provides those who will help equip us and pray for us along the way. I thought of that this week. I felt that when you were praying for me, when some folks pulled me aside and prayed for me yesterday. A few years ago, I was a simple elementary school preacher, uh, teacher and, and thing. I, I'd preach every once in a while. You know, somebody needed a week off. I had some canned sermons there. I could pull them out and switch the name from, you know, Mort Memorial to, to, to Deer Creek Shores to Ackworth. I remember riding home with Laura after I was asked if I would consider this and calling back later and said I would, and I, I hung up the phone, and I, I looked at Laura, and said, what did I just do? Talk about someone unprepared, unaccust- unaccustomed, and ill-equipped. But the promise of Jesus is that we are called to prepare us, helping equip us along the way. Perhaps your call is simply to visit others. Perhaps it's to help clean out the rain gutters or take the trash out to the street. Perhaps it's to stand with others who are fighting for injustice. Perhaps it's being called to, with your energy or example to, to share about Jesus' transformation that Jesus intends for all to experience. And maybe, maybe you're at a moment where, where you're not sure what the next stage is, but I can promise you this. Listen, your call is there. You are never too old. And I hear this sometimes. You're never too old or too young to have a call because you're never too old or too young to love. So keep looking for the good you are meant to do and be open to hearing that next still, small voice. Prepare to be the next one up. No, expect to be the next one up. Always assume you're going to be called into the game and prepare to support the next one up for others' ministries to encourage them as they too do God's work. There's one other thing I want to point out that we often skip over. Do you notice that after John was arrested, Jesus returned to Galilee? The Galilee by the sea. There, there's a little thing that's mentioned in there. You, you might miss over it. I, I did. If I hadn't studied it this week, I, I wouldn't have caught it. But it says that Jesus went to Galilee by the sea, a place of Gentiles. Galilee was full of Gentiles, and the first place that Jesus went was a place he would be uncomfortable, a place of Gentiles. Jesus often ministered to Gentiles and outcasts because that's where the need was. And I don't know if you realize this today, but if you said Lafayette, Georgia, you could add among the Gentiles. Because even though we live in a community in the middle of the Bible Belt, we live in a community that is increasingly unchurched. The vast majority of driveways I pass on the way up here, there are two cars sitting there. I don't think it's because they go to the nighttime service. There are folks in this community in need of our message of hope and our message of love, even if they don't know it yet. According to Matthew, Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness. Friends, are you ready? Willing and able to be the next one up in God's service? Teaching. Claiming the good news and following Jesus' call to let your light shine. Friends, that's the question each of us are asked. And the only one that can answer. 
how will you answer? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we do believe. Help our unbelief. Amen. Friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, let us stand in body or in spirit. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, let us return a portion of the gifts we have been given to Christ's ministry and to those most in need. You join me in the unison prayer of dedication found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Holy God, we present these offerings to you in faith. We trust that you will bless and use them to further Christ's ministry and to serve those in need. May these gifts bless those we know who are suffering and those known only to you. Amen. You may be seated. One additional prayer concern I failed to mention, uh, Ron's brother-in-law passed uh, away, and uh, 
um, they will be traveling to Baltimore. I wanted to say, I wanted to say Buffalo, but I, I don't mean Baltimore for services next week. We will be holding you and your family in prayer. Let's pray. of Epiphany, this season of divine showing, we recall the wonder of Christmas and the birth of Emmanuel with joy and gratitude. Still, our problems, our brokenness, and our suffering remain. Our hearts cry for you as we seek to know you face to face, as intimate as creature and creator can get. So often we can't find you and feel forsaken in the midst of our despair. Show us how wrong we are, holy God. Restore our confidence in your presence. We pause here to focus our minds and hearts on you, God, in this prayer. The psalmist ages ago lifted their prayers to you in faithful confidence. Following their lead, we lift our petitions for the world, our communities, and our loved ones. In your mercy, O oh God, hear our prayers. We pray for our world full of violence, political tension, and suffering. We pray for the Ukrainians who remind us of democracy's fragility and inspire us to cherish our right to self-determination. Protect those who hold to good and resist evil. Soften the tyrants who fail to see the global consequences of greedy pursuits. Lift the lowly in need of grace. Set the oppressed free. In your mercy, O oh God, hear our prayers. We pray for our communities, for the people searching for companionship and communion, for the ill and their caregivers, for the laborers who ensure our needs are met. God, help us see you at work among us, in the bonds we form serving together, in kindness shown and care received, in the ways we grow in understanding and empathy for those whose lives are different. We praise you, God, for the many ways you show up. We praise you for becoming God with us in Jesus Christ. Dispel our doubts and fears so that we can embrace your presence in the flesh. In your mercy, O oh God, hear our prayers. We pray for our loved ones, those whom we hold closest to heart and mind. Comfort those who grieve. Encourage those who are ill. Embrace those who have received bad news. Make space for those who struggle to belong. Generous God, Filter our despair through your good news of great joy, so we might see and know and share your abundant hope and irresistible grace. In your mercy, O oh God, hear the prayers of your people. Help us to live as epiphanies of your work and your presence, showing your love to all the world. Now, hear us as we pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is This Little Light of Mine. The words are found in your bulletin. Let's sing, stand and sing together.
My friends, as you go out into the world, go in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Return no one evil for evil. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and let your light shine. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace, both this day and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.